Hey y'all, I'm standing here with Bill Hibbler, the current president of the North American branch of the Maple Society. Bill, what is the Maple Society all about? Oh boy, that's a, that, that, that encompasses a bit. We have uh, members interested in uh, the scientific or taxonomic side of the trees and what makes them different, but we have uh, a lot of members who just love the shape, the color, the, you know, everything that they provide. They're uh, such a year-round interest. Uh, the whole ornamental side of things. Uh, I'm, I'm, I used to work at a nursery um, and I bought the maples and the conifers for the nursery. Uh, my, I, I loved it and we, it was one of the, uh, the favorite things that people came to us for uh, because we offered such a large variety. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people realize that when they hear the word Japanese maple they always just seem to think of this kind of a mushroom shaped thing with, with delicate leaves. and. When they come to our nursery and I'd show them 250 varieties that we had there and they said, my goodness, I never knew they did all these things. So, so you can so. come to the Maple Society and learn about all different sides of things from yeah. the taxonomic side yeah. to cultivar, yeah. like specific highlights. Yeah. And there's nurserymen here, there's uh, scientists here and collectors here. So there's a huge assortment. Resellers here. Garden centers here. <laughs> yeah. And so there's plenty of people who are here who love Japanese maples. Yeah, and we're forming more regional activities that people came to to learn to prune or else just to sit and talk and, and share some good food. And We've got uh, another one planned next spring that is actually turning into a three-day event. Uh, so nice. uh, we're going to be encouraging that same sort of thing to be happening in the northeast part of the country and uh, southeast and even in the Midwest. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity to have a lot of fun and learn about the trees at the same time. So go to maplesociety.org and... maplesocietynorthamerica.org so Yeah, <laughs> North, maplesocietynorthamerica.org or if you go to maplesociety.org you can click on the, the yep. North American branch yep. and sign up right there online. Right. So either, either one will get you to that same point. Yep. But you can sign up for the North American branch, which is the branch here in the United States, Canada, Mexico. If you like maples, you better be part of the Maple Society. Right. All right, y'all. So we were asked to speak on exciting new maples. Uh, we were <laughs> a great follow-up to our last discussion. We're going to talk about new stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're going to mess that whole thing up way more right now. So if, if you got the right part, let's let's talk about all the new stuff. These are all things that are not in. Uh, None of these are the in book, the last edition. <laughs> the last edition that came out of registered maple cultivars. So, as we're going down through here, uh, this is a little bit of our crew here. Uh, we've actually got about 30 people at Mr. Maple, so this is just some of the crew here. Here's a birthday party we had uh, a couple weeks ago for our office manager, Miss Jody. And uh, we've got an office staff, and we couldn't be even coming to these events anymore unless we had such great staff. So, I had to first mention them. So, the, the idea of new uh, cultivars, you know, maybe it isn't quite so new. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure when that 1700s list came out, there was a guy that was like, okay, this is getting out of hand. <laughs> That's too many. And, and then, you know, by the time Tamukiyama came out, a few years later, they were like, this, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is the cultivar de Sojo. Then later it became Shin de Sojo. Nurserymen for years have always been looking for improvements, looking for something that's different and something that's unique. And for us, it's not about having something new, it's about having something that's unique and different because that's really what should be out there. It's not about just putting another name on a plant. It's about finding something that has a unique set of characteristics that stands out from the crowd, that deserves a place in the garden because there are so many varieties of Japanese maples out there already. You might not always laugh and say, we don't need another blood good. Right. We have so many customers who contact us and they say, Aunt Susie's got this real, real pretty red Japanese maple in the backyard. You've got to check it out. Got to call the Sacer Palmatum Aunt Susie. She's just the best. And we're like, hey, Aunt Susie's awesome. I know. I get it. Like, she's great. But that is a blood good seedling that looks <laughs> just like everything else we've seen. And it brings nothing new to the table. And one of the things we do, we'll actually talk about some new cultivars today. Uh, not all these are our introductions. We'll talk about some new things from town and new things from around the world that we like. Um, but one thing we do at our nursery to evaluate trees, or we actually try to name the seven, well, so we have a, like a five and seven rule, I should say, is the way we kind of go about our program of like introducing plants. We call our introduction program the Area 51 collection 
It's kind of a joke, Talon had the 401 this so we had to come up with our own collection. Well, the Area 51 came about because Dad would sell the coolest plant we were watching while we were away selling trees or at a conference or something. We would come back and Dad would say, Guys, you're not gonna believe this. I sold that big seven gallon in the back for like 60 bucks. And we're like, oh no, that was like the only one. <laughs> like we can't do this. And so uh, actually our friend Richard Bomar, if many of you are in the Maple Society may know Richard Bomar. Uh, he was visiting and he said, I wanna know where the good stuff's at back in the Area 51 area. <laughs> so it became the Area 51 collection. And these are kind of the plants we hid while we could evaluate. And our general rule, and maybe this could be something that would help the society as a whole, for evaluating is that we had the five and seven rule. So for us, uh, we have a billion, we probably, if we redo our list, Brian and Wesley are gonna help us actually update our list this year. And we'll actually hope to come up with an official, like how many cultivars we have listed out. And we'll start to break any, you know, duplicates and things out of that. It's probably around 1400 or more at our, at our place. Uh, maybe 15, I mean, this is guessing. I really haven't, I really quit after a thousand counting um, so we, we know a thousand, but then the rest are kind of off the rails there for us. What we do with the five and seven method is we name the five closest things to something. So if we're going to evaluate it and somebody says, Hey guys, this is really cool. Um, you know, you should think about putting a name on this. A lot of our introductions may come from other people. So somebody may send us something and say, I really like this. Um, and, and we're going to name the five closest things to that. And we need to be able to say how it's better or different than any of those things before we even move forward. So if we can't name five things, there's a million maples out there. Well, is this, does this look like blood good? Is it better than blood good? What, what about it is better than blood good? What about this is different? And, and if you can't do that, you're kind of already introducing something that doesn't need to be out there if you can't do that. And then we'll evaluate that for seven years. And so then we'll get that into some different gardens. It may be Ed Shin, it may be somebody in Texas, it may be somebody, well, we lost Oklahoma now, but you know, we'll get that to some different gardens around the United States and uh, East Coast and West Coast, and we'll say, hey, how did that perform for you? And, and that's kind of our process though for, before we even start to put names on plants. So to start off the presentation, we've got a lot of cool plants that are plants that we got early on or that, you know, we're, we got to really get to push out in the nursery trade too that are really cool or plants that are really awesome from other nurseries we really enjoyed. This is one of the plants we talked about in the auction the other day. This is the Hoshi Zora that we brought back from Kobayashi Mumiji Inn when we were out there and visiting. It's a Ryusin, they said, with a more bold red fall color. You know, Ryusin for us can get to red, but sometimes it's mostly in the orange. This one goes straight to the red. Um, this is one of the newer selections by Kobayashi Mumiji Inn. Uh, extremely cascading type. Uh, these are actually some photos from Alan Castile, if you know Alan Castile. And they named Tamukiyama, and they're still naming new ones today. <laughs> but this, many of y'all may know this plant, it's the selection by Talon, and uh, this is Celebration. This is one of our favorite plants at our nursery. I mean, in the springtime, this gives some amazing pink-red reticulation. The colors on this are some of the best spring colors. During the summer, we get some mm -hmm. bright reticulated flushes on this. And uh, for me, this is one of my, my it's in my, it immediately as soon as I got it mm -hmm. and sort of watching this plant, this became in my top five. Yeah, this was, uh, you know, Talon joked we let the market sort it out. This became a very popular tree for us very quickly. So very quickly demand exceeded um, production and we were trying to get as many of these going as possible. Um, it's been a very popular tree for obvious reasons. Very, very light pink growth on it. Um, good mid-sized grower. It's been a really excellent production plant for us, but people have uh, really responded to it. I think it's one that your average collector was, you know, really drawn to as, I've got to add this. It, it, it kind of had that shock and awe response to it. And there's some photos we have some from customers, like Aaron Dragsess is in California, but if you look at a lot of these other photos, that's because of Brian. <laughs> Our website's good now. <laughs> Brian, Brian, Brian's Brian. able to run around and get photos for us while Matt and I are running around doing crews or other different things. And Which I'm like, Brian, you need to spend a couple skills. days in the greenhouses. <laughs> and Brian runs around taking photos while Matt and I are running and take care of other things. So a lot of these photos, you might notice a lot better photos than the last time we gave a presentation. <laughs> it's because of Brian. So uh, This is an amazing plant. It's a plant that I fell in love with. And we... We're told this is an amazing spring interest tree. This plant has great spring interest. You've got to get this. It's orange in the spring, then it goes to a gold color. 
it's a selection uh, locally here in the area. And uh, Matt and I found some shocking stuff out about it. So we were looking at this plant and my friend selected it for its spring color. Like Tim was saying, he was like, this is better than my Katsura. This, you know, this, why he had picked this, and I'll be honest, it does almost rival Kristen Star. It's a very nice spring orange to yellow. And, uh, a little bit larger tree. Yeah, it's a faster grower. It's a different plant, so it's a, but it's the spring color is one of those shock and awe colors as well. As well. And uh, I, I got the tree, and I grafted it, and I put it in a seven gallon, as we do, because we're hoarders, and we keep a billion of everything. So we've got our Noah's Ark out there of... Japanese maples where we've got two of everything and it kind of got put in the back and I, I'd grafted it a few times but I hadn't prioritized it as much as I should and I went out there to look at it one day and I called him up and I said do you know this thing's a pine bark and he's like no it's not a pine bark but I'm sure of that I said, go, go check your original tree and let me know and he calls me back and he's like damn what's a pine bark <laughs> like this is pine bark is like great bark all the way up this plant and so the original one has a heavy fissured bark. All the subsequent ones do as well. It is a little slower to develop than, say, Nishikigawa or Arakawa. So it is later, but it is one of the first true spring interest variants of a pine bark type. So bonsai guys go nuts for this one because essentially we have a, you know, a, a tree that's going to provide you a lot of spring interest like a Katsura, but also with a pine bark type bark. And then it does go to more of that golden color for a big part of the spring. Amazing plant. We fell in love with it quickly. This is one by Nishki Nursery in Australia. This is Acer Palmatum Emerald Sunset. And uh, this has been a plant that we've loved because the border on this stays for longer than any of the Sumabini types. I mean, they, they said, hey, this is an improved Sumagaki. It really has that Sumagaki, Sumabini feel. The leaf shape is more Sumabini than Sumagaki. And so is the upright habit. So it's definitely got more of that shape of Suma Benny. But the thing is about Emerald Sunset is this border lasts for much longer into the season for us. And so sometimes we can be in our heat of the south in later into June and still mm -hmm. have some purple border and tipping to this plant where our Suma Bennies lose it much quicker in our heat. One of the better recent Australian introductions for sure. This one has a larger leaf as well. And um, it, I'll, I'll describe it a little bit more almost like Osakazuki like on the leaf. It's a large round leaf that then also has this distinctive border to it. Uh, it's a shorter, denser tree too, so it's not quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, the canopy you, you would see with some of the other uh, Benny types. But this one has a really nice short canopy to it and really large leaf with that, that nailed. And again, we've had that actually last for us. We're in North Carolina. Uh, we've had that last long into June for us, so it was pretty impressive uh, for its, its take into the season uh, and, and some of our heat. And many of y'all from Oregon may be like, well, those, last, those other types last long into June where well, our heat draws... Not for us. <laughs> yeah, our heat takes that away. So the fact that this holds so long here in the south means it'll probably hold even longer in those Oregon and Washington areas. Now, this is the spring color where you see a, lot, a little bit more of this yellow-green. And then you start to get more of that summer color where you start getting that emerald color into it up top in the center. So next we've got Catalina Yetabusa. And this was one of the other ones we had uh, in the auction. This is a dwarf uh, Makawa type, found as a dwarf mutation on a Makawa Yetabusa. But it is more Makawa shaped. It's more upright. It's, so It's very much a small vase. The original one is probably this tall, but it's probably only this wide and very much a small V shape. And it's very unique and interesting in its, in its habit. It kind of all wants to go up. We don't know that it's columnar yet. It's, it's an interesting plant and it kind of just has these little, you know, I described it almost like uh, gossamer over top of it, but it gets these little like antennas on top of it. All the new growth is extremely stringy uh, as, as it kind of gets to the top. Everything kind of gets really thin, even in early spring. Not just that late summer growth that's odd. All the spring growth is really thin and small. So next up, we've got Acer Palmatum Rikuzen Shidari. This is one that we fell in love with in Japan when we went to Japan to visit Yataka Tanaka at Sukasa Maple. And this one's got a really fun story behind it. Uh, it's one of those plants that if, <laughs> you know, they, they often say that... I think it's uh, Dr. Creech that says if you have 10 uh, horticulturalists in a, in a room, you have 10 thieves. <laughs> so... So the story of this one goes a little similar. So this is a weeping Aminum style. 
And so this has a leaf like an Osakazuki, but it's got a yellow fall color, which is, makes it very unique. The leaf on this plant is probably in this size range in a three gallon. So it's very much different than Ryusen. This would, this would probably be one of the first of this heavily weeping styles that I would assume is completely out of the lineage of Ryusen. This may be completely kind of more of its own thing. It might not share some of that, uh, uh, that lineage with those, but it, or at least out of Nakakomoto weeping, which many of these probably come from. This one has a, a huge leaf. So I know Matt wanted to tell the story, I want to tell the story. So I'll start it off, I'll let Matt finish All it. right. And so Rikuzen Shidari was at this temple and Yataka Tanaka saw it and was like, wow, that tree is amazing. Went up and asked permission to get cuttings off the tree and was denied. Well, so, you know, you've got 10 horticulturalists in the room, you've got 10 thieves. Some cuttings were procured. And uh, the, the, the interesting thing to the story, and he, he tells the story with a laugh, and so he sat down with us and explained this to us. And he said it was really an interesting story because he then went back uh, to this monastery that there were this temple that had this, and uh, after the tsunami, all was lost. The original tree was gone. And so um, it was kind of a... And this was real uh, important tree at this place. And so it was kind of devastating that, you know, all the damages, but also that this had been completely lost. And uh, he brought a huge tree back and said, this is the importance of sharing. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I think, I think they were more than pleased to receive a replacement, even though he had probably obtained it by alternate means there. He was forgiven. He was forgiven. He actually took it a step further. He said, well, I told them this is the importance of sharing, and I hope you've learned from it. So <laughs> it kind of it went a little further than that. But uh, I, I like the lesson there, share with nursery. <laughs> so, guys, this is one of those evergreen maples, maybe semi-deciduous in some areas. Some of y'all might have saw this in the Ralston the other day. It's near the Laugh House outside. And if you give this some sunlight, you gotta give it a little bit of sunlight, it really picks this up, but it also needs some shade being a nicer lavagatum. They found it at the JC Ralston that if they growed it in full sun, it didn't always thrive the same as it did with some protect with some canopy above it. But this plant is amazing. Mark Wethington did a, a wild collection and collected this plant out in the wild. Probably one of those like Acer Lavagatum affinities. <laughs> and But it was so different than our species. We love with new maples. We're just geeks for species too, so we love cultivars of species that are different. So if there's a cultivar, and that's how we get to Hot Blonde, we love looking through outside the box things that we haven't really explored cultivar statuses of yet. Well, Mark had this growing there in his garden and he said, I mean, he brought us to it and he said, guys, you need to graph this. I think it's cool when it was very young and early on in his wild collection. So we, we got some graphs off this when it was only, you know, probably a foot tall. He's like, please help me save this because this is the only one and it looks nothing like any of our other lavagatum here in the garden. And uh, so Mark was reluctant to name it. So then like five or six years later, we came back to him and we're like, this thing has purple bark. None of the other ones have like purple bark. Like this has a like burgundy jewel-esque color on the bark. It's a very dark bark and it has this very dark foliage. Uh, please give us a name for this. We want to we want to, you know, at least get in the evaluation process, um, and and if you don't name it, we're just going to call it Mark Wethington. So, so we put the pressure on him, and then he came up with a cultivar name for it. And this one really has its lavender colors, but the older growth is more of this weird cast that's almost like a blue purple. Yeah, it's I a mean, weird it's color. Really unusual, really different, and one of the cool cultivars in Acer Lavagatum that's starting to bring interesting super garden characteristics. But again, this was a wild collected lavagatum in the wild. So you're bringing in the best of both worlds. You've got a wild collected plant and you've got something that is something that everyone can enjoy in their garden. So pretty and Mark cool agreed that it stood out so much from any of his other wild collected ones that maybe it deserved a cultivar status. So next up we've got Acer Pomatum Strawberry Spring. Now this is another one of Talon's newer introductions that we fell in love with pretty quickly because of the color. I mean, this is the most baby pink reticulated type that I've seen out there. And it's one of the ones that just lit up in the early spring. It's another one of those, the market decides things. We got this one early on from Talon and it was very popular. Um, you know, we, we can't do enough for this one. It's, it's always in high demand when we have it listed. 
And uh, you can see why. I mean, this is a, a really an interesting addition to, to all the reticulated forms. I think it really brings a lot. Here I put strawberry spring. This is, <laughs> no, this is strawberry. Okay, from the side it looks kind of weird. But this plant really puts on an amazing spring display. Then goes to this uh, creamer color for us. And then this is actually a late summer flush you see down here on the side, down here on the right. But the spring color for that baby pink, there's not much else quite like it. Now, next up, we've got Acer Shirasalum Sunny. Many of y'all may know the uh, little amazing dwarf, the Sir Happy. Um, many of y'all may have heard of Mystic Makawa. Crispine Silva had some really cool introductions. And this was found as a Jordan seedling, as Acer Shirasalum Jordan seedling, that had a brighter orange spring color. And then it goes to the gold that Jordan goes to. So you've got something with the Jordan colors later, but then a little different spring interest. So this is a really cool Shira Solanum hybrid that adds a little bit extra to Acer Shira Solanum. We were really impressed with the spring color. The spring color, I think, is the, the defining thing that set this one out for us. It's a really vigorous grower like Jordan. Uh, has a lot of the nice things I like about Jordan. Maybe a smaller leaf overall, but that spring color was just really, really nice. It has this overlays of orange with a lot of subtlety that, that that yellow below but we get consistently a very very bold dark orange with it how's the growth habit compared to like uh, autumn moon and, uh... Uh, i would say much faster uh, it's going to be more like jordan when it's younger and so it's not uncommon for uh, i would say over a foot of growth a year does it have the thick leaves like jordan very much so it's more sun tolerant uh, we, we, we always typically, in general, with any of the yellows, we normally recommend late day shade. Now that's because a lot of our customers are in the deep south. Uh, this one was originally, Crispin was hoping it would be a little bit more sun tolerant. I know we've recommended late day shade on this one. But uh, That's but we, something that could still be trialed. I haven't put it in heavy, heavy sun myself. But you but, have to realize we're in Western North Carolina where we also say Jordan needs protection from the yeah. hot afternoon sun. So because we, 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 we tend to give it late day shade for, you know, Best, if you can get that early morning sun, you're gonna get that more intense orange, I think. And then if you can provide it with some later protection, it's probably gonna look better longer into the season, would be my guess. So next up's a plant. When we actually went to visit Talon, he's like, you gotta, you gotta have this plant. And so we, Talon uh, found us a purple curl and we fell in love with this plant. Uh, I think actually we ended up getting the original purple curl at our nursery. <laughs> So this one's so weird, only a plant collector could love this one, right? You know, you know you're in the weeds with plant collecting when you're into this one. Uh, your, uh, your big box stores are not going to be mass producing the, the uniqueness of this because it, for, for some people it's almost going to look damaged, but it's so cool. It, it has that malting over top of that curling effect. Uh, our, our customers have loved it. Collectors have went, you know, very, been very, very popular for us. Uh, we can actually get some very dark shades in early spring, like that middle photo. Uh, then then those, those lighter colors start to emerge later into the season for us. And uh, it has been very, very, very popular for us. But, uh, you know, probably not people's first maple. Might, you might start with Blood Good or Tamukiyama and then work your way up to this one. It's probably not going to be your entry point, but it's a really cool plant. So I was asking Brian and Wesley, and I was like, you know, what else do we need to make sure we're including on this from other people? Because I've, I covered a lot of our introductions that we're we'll beginning to here in a minute. And one of the things they said was Bronze Age. And this is one of our employee favorites. It's one of our favorites. I know when I was talking to uh, Haruko the other day, she said this was one of her favorites. And this is another one by Talon that I love the, the, love the name, but has that bronze color in the spring. But just Excellent yellows in the fall. Uh, the fall colors are excellent on this. Uh, it, it's one that we've offered several times at Mr. Maple, and our employees tend to buy them up before. And it's not just these guys. It's all, all the crew saw those in fall color and went, nope. And so those all, one, one time we were about to release them, and like half the set got taken. Uh, <laughs> but it's a fan favorite, especially in person. And I think as it gets out there, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's not known enough, and as it gets more uh, out there, I think it's going to be even more popular. One of the things I really like about it is you get these really dark, uh, you know, that bronzing, that darker color over top of some of the lighter shades. Uh, I've paired this in a garden with Moonrise, and it made just a really fun contrast. I mean, they're, they're very different, but it was a fun sheer solvent to put near that, I think, color palette-wise. you got a growth rate on that one yet? Mine's about six inches tall. <laughs> We've actually had pretty good. I mean, um, most, most of our one-gallons put on 
a very yeah, good rate. Yeah, I would say over a foot of growth typically a year. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's on the upper scale of growth for a sure solvent for us. Acer pomatum Kristen Star. This was found by Bill and Kristen Taylor down in Spartanburg, South Carolina. For us, it has the colors of a cane. It's a smaller growing Katsura type in the early spring. And then the colors midsummer for us in the south with sunlight are very similar to Akane. Yeah. And this one handles the sun in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is pretty hot. And it really picks up the colors when it does that in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Which yeah, we've I, loved this one for its color changes. Um, I, I would very much compare it to a more durable Akane. Uh, again, one of those things where we compare things to what's out there. Uh, I have a lot of trouble growing a Kane in our in our location. It's not one that's been uh, profitable for me. I, I graft a lot of them to get a little of them, and then I, it just didn't really. It was diminishing returns after that. It uh, continued so to get a fungus. One that, yeah, that added to that, and it's not It's not at all the same color, but it's in that vein, and uh, it was one of the most striking spring colors we'd ever seen. Um, again, this is one we could speed up in the process. Bill, actually, uh, the gentleman who had this in his garden had a very mature plant and had a high level of valuation and detailed notes on this plant already. So when you, when you get that kind of information provided up front before you're uh, you know, tasked with finding out this cultivar, we already had a, a great database from him about what to do with this one. So. so next up, this is a plant by Talon that we fell in love with. It's one of our favorite ones of his introductions. The photos won't do it justice because this tree has a glossy sheen to the leaf. And that glossy sheen doesn't quite show up on photos, but it shines. I don't know if you can capture this one to its full justice. It, it literally glistens a little bit in the garden. Uh, and and uh, in person, again, it's been a, a big fan favorite whenever we've had open hours. We, we had Memorial Day. It was our first open time uh, since COVID. And so we'd been closed for two years. And so when we said, hey, we're going to have open hours, we had 750 people show up on Memorial Day. So we were kind of a little overrun, uh, but this is one that when we have those open times in person and people see that spring color, uh, you know, they're, they're gone. So it's very, very popular. Next up, we've got a tree that was found by Carl Munn as a broom on Benny Shishahenga. And the interesting thing is, is this thing is vigorous at an early age, but then tightens up. And uh, this is Pink Princess. We put the name on it, a Pink Princess. Yeah, as uh, a lot of brooms do that kind of get out there at first, you feel like they're gonna be vigorous, but then they slow down a good bit. Um, Pink Princess is one that, again, Carl found there. We were at a plant conference one year with uh, Barry Yinger. Many of you may know Barry Yinger. He's a famous plantsman, and he was saying, and this would go along with some of, uh, to some of uh, Alan's uh, conversation the other day about how some of this stuff forms and some of the uniqueness of some of this. But one of the things that was really interesting is uh, Barry said, um, can you think of any trim, uh, plants that are variegated and also a broom? And so it was a very, I had this in evaluation, Carl sent us some sign wood, and he said, I don't know if this fits my introduction market, you know, I don't know that I'm ever, uh, this is not like Moonrise, it's not a, but the, your collectors are going to love this, you need to graph this. And so we, we grafted it and checked it out for a few years, and he said, well, if you like it, put a name on it and, and do something with it. We went out and looked at the original broom with them there in the garden, uh, but there are only like three or four plants I could think of, maybe people can think of more, but like Sherman's Nordlich maybe, with some of its variegation. Peve, uh, Peve Maribo, and then this were some of the only, this would definitely be the only maple I could think of that was a broom, but also a, a variegated mutation. So it's kind of unique in that. Kind of interesting genetics to have both. So this is Acer Pomatum Firefly. This was actually found by a completely different person, not by us. We got to put the name on it. They had the name on it of Moonfire. And when we started talking to him and he realized that Moonfire was already out in the nursery trade. <laughs> right. And we were trying to figure out, you know, we were like, we've compared this, we've grew this, it stands out from everything else that we've grown. What is this plant? This has been one of our more popular trees that we've put a name on here in our nursery. Um, we kind of did the reverse process. So I told you that five and seven, well, we did this one completely in reverse. We we'd bought this tree uh, from a wholesale distributor. They'd shipped it to us uh, midsummer. And we got this tree and we looked at it and we're like, that's not Moonfire. So, you know, I, I, Tim comes over with me, it's labeled Moonfire. And I'm like, yeah, all these are wrong, <laughs> We've, which happens. And so 
you know, we're, we're like, well, let's let's start the process here. What are our five closest things to this? We lined out Go Series near it. We yeah, lined out like, reticulated mm -hmm. types to it that could be similar. Let's check this against different things to do our due diligence and try to figure out what we actually got here. So we didn't sell it for several years while we were doing this process. And as a result, we kept going back and taking pictures of it. I'm like, dang, that's pretty good. You know, and I go back again. I'm like, man, that's really good. So eventually we call this guy and we're like, Hey, what's, what's up with this? Cause we got this as Moonfire and there's no way it's Moonfire. And he goes, Oh, Moonfire. We, we never sold this one. Really. We thought it was going to be a new hit and we, we called it Moonfire. I never heard of another tree called Moonfire. <laughs> and so, uh, it came in he said, well, if you like it, and it's never really been out there, you should evaluate it and put a name on it. So this one fell into our pocket and we'd already, we did the reverse evaluation process for several years. So next up, this is Dragon Master. This was a chance seedling that we'd went through and found that had that extremely weeping habit. And again, if you push the sunlight with it, you can really push those yellow colors. That's actually Brian's in Oklahoma where he pushed the sunlight up there. This and you one in Flat Rock there. Yep. And then this is the spring when it first leaves out. It definitely gives you some of that orange color. It's a very large leaf amongst many of the weeping yellows now. There's starting to be a few selections of those, but it's a pretty big leaf. Um, I think the best way to almost describe this one, Brian has a photo in his Oklahoma garden we should have put in here, but he has his uh, orange dream and his Dragon Master like compared photos. And it's a very good comparison. I mean, it's completely different shape than orange dream. Obviously we're talking about a Ryusei style shape where it's weeping, but it's kind of a orange dream version of that Ryusei. Now, when we went through and were evaluating a numerous weeping selections, this is one that stood out to us. And we actually evaluated this one for quite a while. And the reason we evaluated this one for longer than some of the others is because if you see that spot over there on the left, that was the very first time that we spotted it. Now we keep getting this, but more random. As, as long as it's slowed down and it's in late summer after that initial flush, early when you first leaf out, you're getting this bordered look to it in a very pale uh, seedling that we selected, but then over time you're getting this more, uh, almost a lighter Higashiyama style veining in it, which has been really unique. <laughs> 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 <All right. laughs> but up here, up here you see a plant in the garden and you can see a little bit of its weeping habit it's, up it's there on that middle shot. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a seedling that We'd been evaluating for years. We grafted, um, it's an Acer Pubi Palmatum uh, selection. And it was collected the same time that Hot Blonde was collected. And it's a more finger-like lunar lobum style looking Acer Pubi Palmatum. Pubi Palmatum's in section Palmata. It's from China. It's often noted for being really drought resistant. It typically has a pretty good fall color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the leaves really don't, they're not something that people always look at and think are really awesome. But as you can see here, this one in the fall color right here, this was before we even named it, where it just has the poopy pal madam and it has some codes here so we knew where it came from. You get from. this tight densing habit on it. it. It tends to be, you know, it, it's not Makawi Atsubusa, but it's in that kind of dense category of low and, and, and forming like that, very tightly layered. But a pretty cool plant. So this is one that we, uh, actually Keith Johansson found this plant. Many of you, when we had the Maple Society meeting, walked right past this one because we were rushed to the, uh, the Cowboy Stadium, if you remember that trip. Well, we went and visited Keith the day before that because we're crazy, and we bought 100 truncatums from Keith and Scott. And I think the first time I walked up to Keith, he said, I'm a certified genius, and he had the, the bucket hat on. And so I, I was hoping we'd get Keith here today. He's a riot. But Keith had this sport on a Macaulay Etzebusa there in his garden. Well, he shared some sign wood with us, and the original uh, sport died off of the tree. Uh, it, it, I don't know how best to describe it. It reminds me a little of like a Manu Sato type coloring. Like it's, it's, it's kind of dark. It definitely gets more of this like emeraldy color in the, the season. When it first leaves out, it, you almost think there's no coloration to it at first. And then it fades to a much, uh, a much more unique defined variegation to it. And growing up, we were always comic book fans. And we figured this would be kryptonite. If you all know anything about kryptonite, it's what makes Superman weak. We figured this would be kryptonite for all the maple collectors. They just kind of weak in the knees when we saw that one the first time. So Looking Glass Falls, uh, 
This was an interesting one. Keep on some of the traditions. Uh, you know, we, we love some of the things we see, and we like to Im imitate some of the things we see. And uh, a, a lot of uh, interesting introductions in Japan may be named after waterfalls or geographic locations. And Looking Glass Falls is right there in western North Carolina beside us. And so it's a beautiful waterfall if you're familiar with the area. Uh, this is a Ryusei uh, style seedling that consistently leafed out every spring with this purple border you're seeing over there. Uh, I wouldn't say it stays as long as Kiyohime. It does fade quicker than Kiyohime, but it's in that vein with a, with a very distinctive weeping habit to it. So the closest thing to this next one, Acer Shira saw on a magic moon, is Talon's purple curl. This is more an, of a green, though. Much more, much more of a green. This is a Shirasalonim seedling that we actually got from Jonathan Savlich. If any of y'all know Jonathan Savlich, that is the guy who named and introduced Lillian's Jewel. This was a chance seedling that he had, mm -hmm. and he said, Hey guys, I'm not going to do anything with this. I'm really looking for Fire Glow, Bihu, and maybe a couple other, but the other ones were some really interesting ones. Yeah. And he was like, why don't we do a trade? And we said, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> done. And we traded and got Shirasawana Magic Moon. And this one has that same modeled reticulation. Or, I don't modeled very malting. I don't know, I don't know how exactly how to describe it. It's more of a malting habit over top of it. Um, distinctly Shirasawana habits to it as it gets fuller. And just a really nice etching throughout each leaf. Uh, it kind of shows up later in the season more as the variegation goes along. Uh, but we really were a big fan of it. Leafs out kind of this ball. I mean, kind of looks like a little moon whenever you first get it with these, these lines in it. Um, and, and I don't know if you know Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan was Del Lauk's grandson. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing a little bit of my voice. Really nice guy. Um, we were trading a lot of trees with him early on. And uh, he actually ended up getting into a lot of legal trouble. And so he's no longer doing the nursery trade. He's actually in jail. And so before some of this happened, he sent us a few cool, really cool things. Really nice guy. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I do care that I tell people Lily Ann because I've met her. I said, well, she's a really sweet girl. She's probably a teenager now. And I actually talked to her last year because we've written him several times and talked to him. But uh, the story behind that, you know, is like this guy actually had a bunch of cool stuff. He was actually a guy who was Dell's grandson and uh, related to Olson. So he had some really cool genetics and what he was collecting from at the time as well and some of those seedlings. Uh, when, when, at the time, this is, this is an anecdote that's crazy, but at the time when he got locked up, he, he had told me, and I texted him back like, hey, how's it going? Never heard back from him, didn't know any of the legal troubles that were going on until I found out later. But he actually had told me he had a weeping uh, seedling that was reticulated completely, like almost like a ghost with the you know, heavily Ryusen style, but with a full like Shigetatsu Sawa style leaf. It's like, wow, so, I don't know what, you know, who knows what happened to that, but. So Matt and I were speaking at the uh, Gulf States Horticulture Expo during their ice storm. There was like five inches of black ice. Matt and I were driving dad's truck, not four wheel drive, uh, around the road, sliding around on black ice to get in to speak to this presentation. And Bobby Green told us, hey guys, I've got this red upright in my dad's backyard. So it's an like, amazing oh, plant. Red upright again. <laughs> but, we got to have another one of those. But here's what's special about this. This thing puts on your regular size growth, but then it consistently, even on a large tree, puts on these really large leaves. And I'm talking large red leaves that are almost Japonicum-esque. And we, so it'll have a mixture of the small regular size leaf. Yeah. I'm say regular blood good size leaf, but then these huge ones popping across it. Tim and I got some pretty good sized mitts, so you can imagine that's actually my hand there. That's a pretty good sized plant when you, and this consistently happened. We actually evaluated this one for quite a while. Uh, we we're like, oh, we don't need another red upright. But then we kept coming back to it and we're like, man, that's cool. Look, I mean, that foliage is just like, you know, you know, huge japonicum style size almost. And this was a chance seedling there. I believe it was actually at, at his father's home. And he was a nurseryman and said, guys, you gotta do something. This is so cool. Uh, please take this and graft it. So. We, we grabbed that and it eventually became Shazam. And if you know anything about DC Comics and superheroes, Shazam's the little kid who says Shazam and then grows to be this massive superhero. And so we thought the, <laughs> the mixture in the, the different leaves was very poetic. <laughs> but we like the, like the size on it. In the, the place where they found the seedling, there were other maples than, than Balmatus or only Balmatus? I've, I've we, never been We have there. no clue. That Bobby Green 
is a nursery who does a lot of breeding with camellias. Okay. And uh, this was his father's home in his backyard. I believe he and, was actually selling the property at the time. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to preserve those genetics before the new owner could cut it down or do whatever. Yeah, I was so, wondering the possibility of we, is it would be a crossing between Barnato or something else. I, I don't know that. I, I would assume low. I, I don't know what other cultivars he was growing. Mostly a camellia grower, but I, I would assume it was just a very unique palmatum. Yeah. So uh, we'll speed it up just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so next up we've got Acer palmatum koi. This is a bronze makawa. It gets some really nice chartreuse veins in it in the summer, but then new growth flushes can be yellow to bronze, which is really cool if you see up here on the left. Uh, definitely another cool, we love those makawa type veinings. We fell in love with Japanese princess, Mayday. This one almost has a cartoonish style leaf to it. Uh, it's hard to capture on photos, but it's quite robust. It gets very dense from within, so a lot of it, as you're growing, it gets really thick inside of it. Uh, it's a really nice plant. We've just really liked the colors. Uh, I need to get a good fall color photo. It's been, I should have put that in here. It's got a, a very um, bright, like more of an orange fall color than any I've seen. It's like a very intense orange. So next up, we've got another local plant by one of our friends, Jason Stevens. He introduced wildfire. This is when that cat should have screamed right here when we put red jaguar. If that had been perfect, if you had the... <laughs> <laughs> but this is a plant that was just found as a chance seedling. And the first flush of growth can sometimes not look that impressive, but it's the summer flush where this one can really have a lot of like spider-like variegation well, coming this across one first, this Yeah, plant. first early spring, you look at this and you're like, it seems like a red upright with a little flex in it. And you're like, oh, it's not that great. And then that secondary flushes start getting more and more intense until you can get this kind of thing going on over here on the left where it's like full on pink and white distortion, Re really unique. So this next one was from those weeping seedlings that we went through. And one of the things we always look for is look at the leaf morphology. What, what stands out? And this is one of the ones that was really unique because this one had a leaf that was not like any of the others. It was more almost Matsumuri in habit, but it wasn't, a, it was not a lace leaf. It's not divided enough to be a lace leaf. And uh, it was in those same batches where, uh, where we found Ghost Dragon, where we found Looking Glass Falls. And this one was one that just was very different in its leaf shape. So this one's, uh, you know, early on it's going to have almost a salmon color. It's been really nice in the fall for us. It's been really popular for customers with hanging baskets, which has been an interesting trend lately. Uh, but uh, it's one that's going to have a very similar style shape to Ryuse that Talon was describing in that it's extremely weeping, but this one provides a another alternative for leaf form uh, to some of those Ryuse styles. So when we went and visited, <laughs> we went and visited. You thought hot sauce and hot blonde were the end, but wait, there's more. We, we went and visited Masayoshi Yano, and Masayoshi Yano had selected two olive veranums from his garden. One was Nakahara Benny A, and one was Nakahara Benny B, and those were code names. We didn't know that at the time. We found out that there was a red one, and we before had gotten Nakahara Benny, what we, it was labeled Nakahara Benny, and it was really Nakahara Benny B. Well, when we went to World Maple Park and started talking and trying to make sure we could find somewhere we could get Nakahara Benny A, Yano, uh, he said, please don't put it out there that way. He, he said, actually, this, is, this is just a code name. Yeah. And he said, if there's a name you'd like to put on it, please, you know, let's, let's talk about it. Well, we later started looking. We had hot uh, blonde. Hot blonde. And so we asked Yano, we said, uh, Yano san, may we put the names hot sauce on Nakahar Benier, which is the red one, on the one that leaves out in the spring with a sort of an orange mm. kind of color, pink, orange, goes to a green. Can we put hot tamale on that one? And he said, yes, fantastic. Well, he so, actually asked us to make sure we put a real name on it before releasing it. And so he said, pick something, you know, in your language that you like and put this name on it. So that was the, that was the preemptive uh, challenge we were listed with there. We correspond with Yano-san through Facebook quite a bit, one of the translators. And we've got some friends that we... He was very gracious when we toured there to provide some translators. And so we still... Uh, go through them to talk to him when we can. But the cool thing was when we went to World Maple Park, Yano-san allowed us to collect seeds at World Maple Park. This isn't something that's allowed that often because Yano-san loves doing this too. And he allowed us to collect seed off of the Oliveranum that he selected 
hot sauce, and hot tamale from. And when that happened, we ended up with hot chicken. So this was kind of a joke of a name. Jody, our office manager, actually built the page and just put a name on it because we were joking about it. But it has more of that... Um, Cecilofolium, yes, angel feather Yeah, more type. of that Koshi Minnow Hagaromo style foliage. It's very unique. Uh, it's a very beautiful tree. It kind of grows in these interesting clusters and it leaves out with a lot of color to it. We've just really been interested. In it, it, uh, it was distinctly from Yano's Oliviernum, so it was just interesting to have that variability going on in that. And it's one we have under evaluation. It, it may reach cult of, you know, we may try to do something with it, we may not, but it was interesting to us in that it was in that, that, that same uh, grouping with the other two from his plant. And we considered calling it Hot Wings, but then there's the trademark name, Hot Wings, so on another maple, so we said, no, let's, let's, let's look at hot chicken. But uh, this is a pooby palmatum that we've been evaluating for years. He actually took this when we were pulling out to come here. He's like, stop. He ran back and took a picture of it for and the this, presentation. And this thing has variegation splotches all across it. And this is when we've been evaluating for just as long as hot blonde. The, the variegation keeps popping up on all the grass. Yeah. This is a chance seedling that came from the same time we collected and... Uh, Flying daggers. Flying daggers. And so... There's some interesting variation there in another species that may make it into something one day. But Pui Palmatum, again, has some amazing fall colors. And again, this is just a variegated one that we still under evaluation, hadn't put a name on, but it's pretty, pretty cool. So this is one we like a lot. This is a Makawi Atsabusa seedling we're calling Red Panda. Uh, we've evaluated several of like the dark reds. Uh, this has been our best one to date. It's really held it very well. Uh, I, get, I get so many requests for... For this one, uh, I had a guy weeding my yard last year, famous last words, and I said, hey, make sure, you know, don't go near my, I've got a whole Makawa bed. It's got all my favorite Makawas up there. And this one was a nice little, you know, this kind of size, the original seedling. It was actually slower than some of the grafts from it, but the original one was there in the garden. It was getting quite robust. And uh, he did very well until about the fourth time the weed eater came and he sent one of his new guys. Load oh, this one right down. <laughs> so uh, I lost the original one. It's actually about this big now. I'm restarting it because it's from seed. So they got some little shoots coming up at the out of the part of the year. But the difference is we've with... been grafting this one for several years from that one though. So we do have the cultivar, but and it's a very unique red form. Yeah, and this is one that whenever there's another red Makawa type that's more of a red, we go and set it next to it. Watch how long this one holds this red color. And it is still a spring interest Makawa type. But the difference is that this one just holds it longer than many of the others. And then when the summer flush happens, this one tends to have more of that red color for us in, our, in the deep part of the south for much later in the season. And so for us, this one has been the most red form where... You know, like Japanese Princess would be more of that pink style for us. Everybody's where evaluating it in the Northwest yet? Yeah. <laughs> no one's evaluating it besides our nursery yet. We, we haven't. It, we, it, it's on for our We've actually been, as you know, with Makawa types, it takes forever to get a little bit. But we've been, we've got a lot of this one going. Fortunately, before the main one got cut down, we have some bigger ones than that one now. But uh, it, it's been a really cool one for us. I was, uh, I was walking around the uh, the nature center with my daughter, and they had an exhibit for red pandas, and I thought, I like that. And it was and, already kind of fitting that color palette for us that time of the year. And I'll tell you, we went through thousands of Makawa seedlings. Talon has sent us plenty of Makawa seedlings. We went through Makawa seedlings from... Uh, Ed Shin's Garden. Ed Shin's in, Garden. We went through a red Makawa seedlings from uh, Dr. Charles Murray. Yeah. We've had a lot of different ones. We probably tagged over 200 for evaluation. And that was from 5,000 that didn't even get to the, the next level. And then we'll... We kind of go with Talon's method of we'll throw a name on it whether we're going to do anything with it or not. So just because we've put a name on it doesn't mean we've made it a cultivar. We may, it, it makes more sense to me than Mr. Maple 200485. I can never wrap my head around what that is. But if you say, hey, there's a red panda over there, I'm like, hey, I remember what that was. So it helps with the, the process whether it makes it to the trade or not. And there's way more of these Makawa types that didn't make the cut for us. <laughs> Tons that didn't. Oh, gosh, probably, probably put names on like like literally 200 and then the only the ones we like make it. And then lastly, we've got Hot Blonde. I mean, this is our Acer Olive Rainum that uh, grows very fastly. Um, this is it under 55% white poly at the nursery. 
And this really is probably one of our best introductions that we've yeah. came up with yet whenever it comes to something that's vigorous, something that gives some good color, and something that's unique. Yeah, we, uh, we, we're not keen on real big on patents. Uh, you know, I've seen some of my friends do patents and they've just had to police them. And we had a lot of interest in patenting this plant. We had people contact us from Europe about patenting this and we had several companies in the US were probably stupid for not, but we didn't patent this. We just decided to put it out there. Uh, it's not really how our relationship works with plants. To, we don't wanna be dependent on, this is our one thing we have to police and patent every year. And uh, so we didn't do that, but we also want it to be uh, not a tree that dies out because it's not produced. We like when other people produce something we name. It's not a, it's not a point of like, oh gosh, they're selling our plant. It's more of like, oh cool, you know, it's starting to make its way. We wanted this to be something that was, that was shared and popular, and that's what we liked about it. That's how we got into it. Uh, so we did get a lot of interest on patenting this one, but we didn't. It's a really fun Acer Livianum, a very fast growing, excellent fall color. You've heard us talk about it a lot, but it's a really nice pink red fall, and it's been exceptionally heat tolerant for us. I, I did get extra credit. Uh, we, we, we chickened out, full disclosure. We, uh, we, had, we were going to name this one Hot Blonde. It had Hot Blonde on it. I had Hot Blonde on it, and somebody said, you're going to get canceled with that. I said, it could be a guy or a girl. You don't know who Hot Blonde is. And so uh, we had thought about putting Golden Ticket on it. And so we had made one Facebook post one time and said, we're thinking about calling this Golden Ticket. Well, a friend of ours who would patented a plant said, I have a patented Golden Ticket. Please don't. And I said, well, it's meant to be. We're going back to Hot Blonde. I'm keeping it, dang it. So we went back to Hot Blonde, and I, I got extra credit because I named this one after my wife. So. And so up here, these sort of salmon pinks you see up here this sort of orangey color on the new growth that's during the summer and uh that's it starts doing that over top of the more sort of yellow color i think this is a plant that may be a plant that wants more sunlight um it's a plant that if you put it in the sun it grows faster more vigorously and it brightens up the colors definitely on this and this is one y'all might have heard me say this the other day but in Bishopville, South Carolina, which is a very extremely hot climate, we're talking 8B on the verge of 9, uh, this can handle full sun. And so... We've it, trialed it with and, some and people in the battery in Charleston. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, there's a customer of ours that's been growing this for, oh gosh, probably eight years now. And uh, it has performed exceptionally well. They're not getting any spray from the ocean, but they are you know, within sight distance. They have some protection from other homes, but they're from sight distance to the ocean there in Charleston. And it's, it's very, it's performed extremely well for them. And uh, here's our Nichols family. Uh, our best introductions. I've got three little ones here. Uh, that's Car we'll go back real quick. So this is my wife here, Carla. That's Matt's wife over on his side. This is our, our uncle Glenn and Aunt Vivian, our parents on this side. And then Matt's kids are... So these are the best ones I've named. This is Tinsley, this is Hicks, and this is Carolina. And I joke my wife. My wife did all the work, I let her name him, but I, I did name my son uh, after Hicks, my grandfather, who uh, he passed away when I was six and was you know, really one of the coolest, my first superhero. So I, I did name him after my, my grandfather. He's six months old, three and, and five. So those are, those are my best ones yet right there. <laughs> and so guys, that concludes uh, our new introductions. All right.